Over the mountains and deserts just north of Las Vegas, there's a show in rehearsal. A show that's been seen over the years by more than a quarter billion people. The performers have included some of America's best fighter pilots. They call themselves Thunderbirds. And their stage is the sky. Assuming men and women who are constantly striving to do their personal best. This is a story of high-tech machines, powerful and fast enough to fly at twice the speed of sound. Men and machines. As a team, they soar to the heights of their profession and represent the very best qualities of America's armed forces. Their dedication is as intense as the fire from their afterburners. And when all the team's talents are combined for an aerial demonstration, they truly bring the legend of the Thunderbird to life. Riding 12 tons of thrust, the Thunderbirds cut through the sky like their legendary namesake, a bird-like creature that screamed across Indian folklore. The god of lightning and thunder, who assured success in war and that good would triumph over evil. Through the dedication of this Air Force team, the Thunderbird legend lives on. This summer, over 20 million Americans will watch the Thunderbirds perform above their heads. Since the early 50s, the team has appeared in over 50 foreign countries. The Air Force calls them America's ambassadors in blue. And presidents, dating back to Dwight Eisenhower, have used the Thunderbirds to represent the United States all around the world. But as the pilots focus their concentration on the aerial maneuvers, there's little time for thoughts of the team's historic past. During the next hour, we're going to take an inside look at the United States Air Force Thunderbirds. We'll see what it takes to be part of this elite squadron. We'll go back in time for a rare look at Thunderbird teams of the past. We'll meet the men and women who keep the planes flying. And we'll learn about G-forces as we ride in the cockpits with the pilots. Soon, this Thunderbird team will perform the first air show of a nine-month demonstration season. As a team, they've been practicing for months. As individuals, they've been preparing all their lives. All right, uh, it's our first low show at Nellis, uh, first low show at a strange site, so you can see there's some uh, little bit of differences. Any comments on the takeoff? After every Thunderbird demonstration, the commander leader of the team, who also flies the number one jet, guides his fellow pilots through a critique of their individual and team performance. With comments from the squadron's logistics officer, each maneuver from takeoff to landing is discussed and evaluated. Every rehearsal and performance is videotaped for these extensive debriefing sessions. The cameras are placed at show center to ensure that the aerial routines look their best to the audience below. Timing is a critical factor for any performer, especially when you're flying a high-performance aircraft. Although there's some lighter moments, it's obvious that the Thunderbird pilots are their own toughest critics. But overall, I was, uh, I was pretty well pleased with the show today, and uh, uh, everybody did a pretty good job. We'll uh, go out this afternoon and do better. Any questions?
fully appreciate the tradition behind the Thunderbirds, let's briefly visit the Squadron's museum at Nellis Air Force Base. On public display are some of the tokens of recognition which have been given to the team by civic groups, private citizens, and government dignitaries from all over the world. Through the years, the team has been honored with the keys to numerous American and foreign cities. To show his appreciation, this gold and diamond scimitar was presented to the Thunderbirds by King Hassan II of Morocco. Handcrafted models and gifts reflect the heartfelt admiration of inspired Americans. The Thunderbirds have been the subject of literally hundreds of magazine and newspaper articles. And the walls of the museum are covered with the photographs of every Thunderbird team from the past to the present. They represent an impressive amount of flying talent. Retired General Dick Catledge commanded the first team flying the F-84. In May of 1953, I was stationed at Luke Air Force Base as a squadron commander. In May, uh, Luke received a directive from headquarters USAF to form a dedicated air demonstration team. We would dedicate the pilots, air crews, and maintenance people to this mission. After about two weeks of having the mission on the base, I was selected as the leader of the first team. In selecting a name for the team, we decided to run a contest in the base newspaper. The name we actually selected was the Stardusters. And we used the name the Stardusters for about one month, and then our boss at uh, command headquarters uh, sent us a directive that said, I don't like that name. I'd like for you to name the team the Thunderbirds since you're in the Phoenix area, and that's legendary in that area. Uh, the total team consisted of five demonstration pilots, uh, one public information officer, one maintenance officer, and 30 maintenance personnel for the aircraft. At that time, uh, the team leader would uh, select somebody, tap him on the shoulder, and ask him if he would like to be a Thunderbird. It's quite a lengthy selection process today. Our routine, the first one, was conceptually different in that uh, we decided to keep the show right over the airstrip all the time. So we did about a 15-minute demonstration with a constant 4G back pressure on the stick. We were never out of sight of the crowd. We were. We never flattened out. We did our turns right from uh, one maneuver to another, 4G constantly. Uh, we, were, we had no restrictions. We were permitted to fly as low as we wanted to fly, do anything we wanted to do. So we had to practice self-discipline. And uh, we had a very good record, despite the, uh, the lack of regulations and restrictions. Uh, we had no accidents, we did not scratch an airplane. In 1956, the Thunderbirds began flying the world's first supersonic jet fighter, the F-100 Super Sabre. Retired Colonel Hoot Gibson, a combat ace from the Korean War, took the team south of the border. I was fortunate enough during my tour on the Thunderbirds to be able to take them to South and Central America. We went to every country, and I remember we flew in Rio de Janeiro over Sugarloaf, and we had over a million people watch our show in Rio. But one of the most memorable shows was the one we flew in Paraguay. Strosimar is the president of Paraguay, and he asked me, would we break the sound barrier? And I said, no, that we could not break the sound barrier because it would break the windows out of the houses and do some damage, which we didn't want to do. But we were there for goodwill. And he said, well, what do I have to do to how far around the airfield would it break the windows? And I said, 10, 12 miles. He said, well, I have them tape all the windows for a 12 mile radius of the airport. And I want you to open the show supersonic. So we did that. The morning we went out to the airfield, I noticed that all the windows from the time we left the, town, the city of Asuncion to go to the airport, all the windows were taped. And we opened the show supersonic. And when we landed, the last 2,000 feet of the runway was covered with people. So when I rolled down the runway and rolled into the crowd, they just moved out of my way because I rolled in very slowly because I kept going to number six like called he'd landed and had a good shoot and then I turned around and taxied back. To show the security we had, we landed on these airfields, we parked our airplanes, we left them set overnight, we had no guards, and we landed and 
crowds all came out to the airfield, just like they do here in the United States. Came out and gathered around the airplanes, and we stood on the wings of the airplanes and signed their autographs. And it was really a, a goodwill tour, which it was supposed to be. And we think we created a lot of goodwill. Good morning, Las Vegas. It's 6.30 a.m., 55 chilly degrees, going all the way up this afternoon to the high 80s. In 1956, the Thunderbirds moved from Luke Air Force Base in Phoenix, Arizona to their present home in Southern Nevada. Nellis Air Force Base, a high-tech oasis perched in the sun-baked Mojave Desert. The disciplined lifestyles of the people who work here contrast with the celebrated glamour of nearby Las Vegas. At Nellis, Thousands of men and women go about the very serious business of America's defense. This is one of the busiest military air bases in the world. Thousands of airmen have passed through Nellis over the years. During World War II, over 500 B-17 crewmen were graduated from its gunnery school every five weeks. In the Korean War, Virtually every fighter pilot received his combat training on the vast ranges that surround Nellis Air Force Base. Today, in addition to maintaining combat-ready fighter squadrons, Nellis also hosts training exercises that involve virtually every type of military aircraft. The Army, Navy, Marines, plus Allied forces from around the globe also visit here for advanced schooling. With access to over three and a half million acres of ranges, Nellis has evolved into a mecca of higher learning for aerial combat. Not surprisingly, it's come to be known as the home of the fighter pilot. Nellis Air Force Base is the headquarters of the United States Air Force Tactical Fighter Weapons Center and the home of Red Flag, the most sophisticated, most realistic aerial combat scenario in the world. When a crew returns from a red flag exercise, they often feel like they've actually been at war. It's the home of the Tactical Fighter Weapons School, the granddaddy of all other Top Gun schools. Nellis, home of the fighter pilot, is also home of the United States Air Force Air Demonstration Squadron, known throughout the world as the Thunderbirds. The emblem on the floor has a lot to do with pride and tradition. It's been there for a long, long time, and uh, it symbolizes the Thunderbirds. For enlisted personnel, volunteering for the team doesn't guarantee the right to wear the Thunderbird emblem or patch. To earn that privilege, they must pass a 21-day trial period. It's a time when would-be team members learn by heart the traditions that will bind them to their fellow Thunderbirds. During the trial period, you're in here an hour prior to anybody else, um, doing different squadron details, such as waxing and cleaning the patch, uh, doing different brass items around, polishing up brass, sweeping floors, just details that are supposed to be done before anybody else gets here. The day I got patched, it was pouring rain and really cold out there. The wind was blowing, and uh, a lot of things were going through, through my mind, like when to salute, uh, what is gonna ask me, um, just everything going through my mind, you know, what to say and what to do. And when they asked me what the commander of the Blue Angels was, and what kind of aircraft to fly, who makes it, and what kind of support aircraft, I knew the answer and I knew that I'd get it right. It really felt good. When a no patch successfully completes his trial period, all the Thunderbirds gather for his patching ceremony, 
a gesture of confirmation that the new member has earned the right to wear the Thunderbird emblem. Chris Brown is now a Thunderbird. Getting the pass really means, you know, you're one of the team, and uh, it's a feeling you really can't explain. I was looking ahead, and uh, I think that's what kept me going, looking ahead, knowing what was really out there. Never been with an organization, a unit that has had the people that work together as a team and uh, all as one as the T-Birds do. Took a lot of time, a lot of studying, but it's definitely worth it to get the patch. As a fuel system specialist, Airman Chris Brown is now part of an elite team. Each Air Force fighter is assigned a crew chief who is personally responsible for its mechanical operation. Keeping supersonic jet fighters in the air demands the talents of many people and countless hours of preparation go into each minute of an air show. Individual and group efforts form a team spirit that pays off in mutual trust and confidence. In the air, the pilot's actions are enjoyed by thousands of spectators below. But the crowd rarely notices the work of the ground crews who keep the planes flying. Thunderbird pilots don't perform the usual pre-flight checks that are standard procedure for all other Air Force pilots. That's the responsibility of a Thunderbird crew chief. I was always a little bit of a tomboy. I could break things very easy, and I got into a little bit of mischief trying to build my own skateboards and things like that. But I never dreamed that I'd work on aircraft. Now, as far as... Tech here, Sergeant I've... Sue Moore began repairing Air Force jets in 1973. In those days, it wasn't a typical career for a lady. And I, that was, it was easy for my dad to accept. That was, he was very proud of that. But it was difficult initially for my mother to accept. You know, her little girl was out there getting greasy and dirty and things like that. And it was a real eye-opener. It, it taught me a lot of, of what I could do myself. My job as far as maintenance management is really, if we don't do our jobs, the air, aircraft aren't going to fly. The time change items on the seat are so critical because that's the only way the pilot has out. If an accident or something should happen, that ejects him out of the aircraft. So if one of these items should be overdue or if they don't work, they've malfunctioned because it has been installed in the aircraft for too long and we didn't catch that, then yes, if, if something should happen to the pilot that he couldn't get out of the aircraft, they could look at us and say, all right, it's extremely critical, and our job is very, very important to the safety of the air crews. The F-16 is capable of maneuvers far beyond the tolerance of human endurance. When a pilot puts an aircraft into a tight turn, the laws of physics try to pull the blood from his upper body. During these high G maneuvers, a 160 pound person can effectively weigh over a thousand pounds. These physical demands on a fighter pilot can be overwhelming. To best explain G forces, let's take a ride on one of America's top rated roller coasters, the Thunderbolt, located at Pittsburgh's Kennywood Park. As the coaster crests the top of a hill, riders feel the hollow sensation of partial weightlessness or a G force of almost zero. When the roller coaster enters a steep bank, riders experience momentary forces of about three Gs. Now imagine controlling a jet six feet away from another aircraft under a constant pressure of four to six Gs. To be, become a demonstration pilot is what we call a special duty assignment in the Air Force. You have to be a volunteer for it. When Captain K.C. Scowl of Wilmar, Minnesota volunteered for the Thunderbirds, he was an instructor assigned to an F-5 squadron. Although he had logged over 1,800 hours in high-performance jets and had graduated as top gun from the fighter weapons instructor course, he had never actually piloted an F-16. We realized they only get one, maybe two shots at it, at the flying, so they're going to be a little bit nervous. KC, it's for you. The captain was participating in a red flag yes, exercise at Nellis when he got an unexpected yes, call from the commander leader of the Thunderbirds. Yes, sir. I, I can be there right away. His evaluation right, flight sir. with I'll the team right had been moved minutes. up. As he walked along the flight line, he was more than just a little nervous. It's like having your driving skills tested yeah, in a car ten you've ten never ten driven. Ten stick. You need a left tendency, you push on the left, we tend to break that wing to the left. Okay, so just straight on back and then... We just, just tell them to, uh, to fly the best they can. After all, every time we go out in public, you're going to have some pressure on you. Captain 
scowl past his evaluation. But the final decision of who flies with the Thunderbirds is made 2,400 miles to the east at Langley Air Force Base, the headquarters of Tactical Air Command. Well, ultimately, I'm responsible to select not only the leader, but all the members of the Thunderbird team. And I do that uh, very carefully. There are lots of applicants. Uh, there's a lot of people who would like to be the leader and commander of the Thunderbirds. But being a commander demands more than just having the ability to fly an airplane very well. It demands that the individual uh, be able to run the organization and lead, not necessarily manage. As I tell my people, we lead people and we manage things. So I need a leader. I need a dynamic leader, a charismatic leader. I need one who's articulate. I need one, above all, who has the highest integrity. And those are the things that I look for when I select that leader. It's a special day at Nellis Air Force Base. In a few minutes, all runways will close while the Thunderbirds perform their final practice before the first scheduled air show of the season. Technically, it's a practice, but every team member performs as though 100,000 fans are watching. In just two days, the team will fly to Tucson, Arizona to kick off the first of more than 75 air shows. Emotions run high, not unlike those of a sports team taking the field before a big game. As the planes begin to taxi to the runway, the pilots give the traditional Air Force thumbs up salute to their fellow team members. This year, the air show schedule will separate the team from their families and loved ones from late March until early November. It's all part of the job. It's all part of being a Thunderbird. Sometimes I wish he had a, a typical, if there is a typical job, um, like in the outside world. It, there are times, especially weekends, weekends it gets, when you see other people out with their families, uh, especially Sundays, and he's never home on Sunday, I wish that he had a typical job, but he wouldn't be happy, and so it wouldn't be worth it. You have to remember the person that's back home, because we're, we're gone 200 days a year, we're on the road, we're Sometimes we stay at nice hotels, sometimes we get treated very favorably. And the wife is back home, she's, she's got the kids, the, uh, the car is broken down, uh, the toilet backs up, uh, you know, she gets a crank phone call, and she really has it a lot harder than we do. I think Roger has always kept his priorities straight. It's hard, he doesn't have nearly as much time to spend with us as he used to. But I think his priorities are the same in keeping the families together and having us maximize our time together. And this will be our last weekend. One more weekend, and uh, I'm on the road. Another difficult aspect uh, of the job is uh, missing yeah, out right. on the family yeah, activities. Uh, we're going to Tucson, but I guess where you were born. Remember that? Yeah. You do? Well, good. Good memory. <laughs> we're gone 200 days, and uh, I have two young sons that. Uh, to require some of my attention and so it's, it's difficult to leave them behind and uh, miss out on the soccer practices and the baseball practices and, and things where a father and son would normally do 
you miss out on that for a couple of years. So when you are home, you try to, to make the best of that as you can. You try to get out there and uh, play catch with them or, or kick the soccer ball around with them or, or help them out with their homework or try to take some of those duties that uh, my wife would normally do when I'm at home, and, and I try to take up those when I'm at home, uh, help them with their homework and that kind of thing. When I was uh, trying out for this job, um, I didn't go out and try out for it without asking my wife first. She basically said, well, you know, it's going to be a hard time for us. Uh, it's going to be some sacrifice, but it's uh, one of those opportunities that very few people get to do. So press ahead and go ahead and do it. And, uh, and then that's what we're doing. And uh, so far, we've been uh, hanging in there and uh, doing pretty good. And got one more year left. And uh, then after that, it's all behind you. And it's just something you can look back upon. The when he was working um, in his staff job, he was not happy. He's happy flying, and so I'd rather him have a job like this. And there's always the consolation that it's only for two years, whereas a lot of people have jobs like that, and they're always gone. So I have two years to return to normal. <laughs> Letter one, you tax and position hold only three, right? Thunderbird 1, uh, Thunderbird departure approved. Change to departure. The wind is calm. Clear for takeoff. Runway 8, free right. Clear ready, 7. Stand by, boss. You're on. Thunderbird's check. 2, right. 5, 6. Black front of mine. Thunderbird's full spikes. Ready now. The throttles are pushed forward and the brakes are released. The final practice session begins. For 30 minutes, the sky over Nellis Air Force Base comes alive as the six F-16s perform their aerial ballet.
As the jets taxi home in the heat of the Nevada sun, the commander leader knows his pilots and crews are prepared for the demanding schedule that lies ahead. After three months of grueling practice, this Thunderbird team is ready to carry on the tradition. In our organization, we work anywhere between 12, 16 hours a day. We work until the job is done. So there's really no, no such thing as overtime. In the heat of the desert sun, the temperature inside the Thunderbird hangar often climbs to over 100 degrees. But the work goes on. This aircraft is scheduled to fly to Tucson in less than 12 hours. And if it means working all night, it will leave on time. A sophisticated fighter like the F-16 is actually a marriage of computers, pneumatics, hydraulics, electronics, fuel systems, miles of wire, and one very powerful engine. All the parts must function in perfect harmony. After every 150 hours of flight, the plane must undergo a phase inspection. The entire plane is literally disassembled. All the access panels are removed, and every part of the aircraft is critically inspected. Certain parts of the F-16 are designated as time change items. This means they must be replaced after a specific number of flight hours. Just like commercial airliners, military fighters are constantly being updated and modified to enhance their safety and reliability. To produce the white smoke trail that's part of the airshow demonstration, each of the team's F-16s are modified with a 50-gallon tank that's filled with smoke oil. A high-pressure pump controlled by the pilot forces this fine oil into the hot exhaust of the engine. Although each member of the Thunderbird maintenance crew has a specific responsibility, everyone chips in to expedite the phase inspection. It's not unusual to see an engine specialist assisting with the installation of a flight control computer or a radar technician helping to change a hydraulic actuator. If there was ever a serious national emergency, within 48 hours, this crew would have the demonstration aircraft restored to combat-ready status. Military gray would replace the fancy red, white, and blue paint scheme. When these technicians complete their two-year tour of duty with the team, they'll share their experiences as Thunderbirds with Air Force squadrons stationed all over the world. The Thunderbird crew has the right to be proud of its work. Since the team was formed over three decades ago, there has never been a performance canceled or curtailed for maintenance reasons. Well, when I was little, believe it or not, I was afraid of flying. I used to go flying with uh, one of my dad's friends, and I used to hold on for dear life. Captain Bert Nelson, the team's narrator, also flies media flights in the two-seat B model F-16. Like the other pilots, Bert spends some of his time corresponding with young people who write to the Thunderbird squadron. Well, I, th I think the kids look up to us because what we do is exciting. We uh, interact with them a lot on the road. We get to go see them sometimes in kids' hospitals. We get to talk to them. We obviously get a lot of them in the crowd line. And uh, we get letters from them here in the squadron, some of them just asking about what the flying's like or what we do here, some people asking for pictures. They're pretty important to all of us, really. They, uh, they're the future for the Air Force and for the country. And uh, when we interact with them, obviously we're trying to set a good example for them, uh, maybe as a role model for them to look up to someday. We can affect their lives in a lot of ways by setting this good example and, and telling them a little bit about our job. How do, how do you put these straps on? Okay, when we go out to fly, we have a harness that we wear. And it's got a couple clips on the top of it. There's one on each side that goes over our shoulders. And that's what hooks us into the ejection seat. That's that? what I'm ask. It's like a little TV screen, but it's our radar. Talking about wanting to see the engine back there where all the thrust comes from. They ask Watch what it's like here. to fly in the airplanes. Sometimes what it's like to work around the Thunderbird squadron. Talking to them, we can tell them the ways we get here. It, it just doesn't happen overnight that you get here. But what we have to remember is you got to do the best you can at whatever you're doing. And eventually, you keep working and hopefully you'll achieve the goal that you've set, you've set for yourself. Well, our mission, the mission of the Thunderbirds basically is to, to go out and show uh, people who don't 
get that much chance to interface with the military, we take the Air Force to them and we show them what we can do. We show them the pride and professionalism that a military person can have in his job, the precision formation that we can fly and what we can do with our military equipment, the capabilities that we have. And the people are, are very, very favorably impressed and we get very little negative reaction. And there's always that concern over the money. You know, is this costing me money? Well, you can look at it in a couple ways. Uh, these airplanes are already bought, they're paid for. If we weren't flying Thunderbirds painted red, white, and blue, we'd be flying F-16s painted gray. So what we're doing is taking little added expense as far as painting them and the, uh, taking them out on the road and showing them to the public while still maintaining that combat capable status. My first interest in flying was I was influenced by my father who was a pilot. He was in the Air Force for 24 years. And I, I guess the first time I remember uh, about flying or him flying, I, I remember I was just a kid and I was at the swimming pool. We were stationed at Holloman Air Force Base. And I was in the swimming pool splashing around. I was about four or five years old. And, and here comes this airplane it's flying upside down over the swimming pool. And of course, it's my dad. He's, he's kind of showing off. And so that's kind of my first experience, although we can't get away with things like that these days, but back in those days, you could. In 1969, the Thunderbirds began flying the powerful F-4 Phantom. For a period of several years, the Navy's Blue Angels and the Thunderbirds flew the same type of aircraft. Retired General Thomas Swalm commanded the team from 1969 to 71. Uh, the F-4, of course, was, a, was a, uh, an anomaly uh, at that time uh, in, uh, in aviation. Um, Laurels. It was a very powerful airplane. It's the first time we, we came along with an airplane that we could maneuver as well uh, and, and, and do the things that, uh, that we were able to put in an air show uh, from a power perspective so much uh, easier than we could uh, in the past. Also, of course, it was the airplane that was uh, probably getting as much attention as any in Vietnam. It was uh, an airplane the Air Force relied on very heavily for both its uh, air superiority mission and uh, and also it's, uh, it's air-to-ground mission, delivering ordnance for our own U.S. Army. So uh, a great airplane and one that uh, I think a lot of people wanted to see uh, in the air show environment in those years, uh, 1970, 71, 72, and 73, as the Vietnam War was drawing down. And of course, uh, the F-4 uh, has to go down in history as, as being uh, uh, the aircraft that flew not only the best air show, but the loudest. The F-4 also consumed a lot of fuel. And during the energy crisis of 1974, the Thunderbirds switched to the fuel-efficient T-38 trainer. This was the first time that the Thunderbird team had gone from a frontline fighter, if you will, to uh, a trainer-type aircraft. Also, every single Air Force pilot uh, could relate to the T-38 because uh, uh, in those days, uh, as we still do today, uh, all Air Force pilots flew the T-38 as part of their uh, basic pilot training. Some of the disadvantages of the airplane, it was uh, it didn't have uh, all the power that we would like for it to have in performing the aerial maneuvers that the demonstration required. It, uh, it also did not have air refueling capability, so that meant when we went from Nellis Air Force Base, our home, to the East Coast, it required three hops, which made a very long day out of it just getting around. And it also limited us essentially to the continental U.S. The Thunderbird team has a tradition of excellence and uh, trying very, very much to perfect everything they do. Uh, the feeling was that we knew we would never fly that perfect air show, but we always tried. This is News Center 9 with Guy Atchley, Stephanie White, Weather with Robin Zimmerman, and Sports with Dave Silver. What's it like to fly with the Thunderbirds? The Air Force flying team is in town for a couple of shows this weekend, and they picked a member of the media to experience the ultimate roller coaster ride. Our Margarita Zavala is the one they chose, and here is her story. The Thunderbirds arrive in Tucson the day before the season's first scheduled air show. First on the agenda is a media flight with a local news anchorwoman. Before she takes off, Margarita Zavala must go through an hour of training and familiarization that would be critically important in the unlikely event of an in-flight emergency. So 
now the next thing that's going to happen is she's going to be fitted by Sergeant Schenkelberg uh, with the G-suit and the uh, helmet and the mask that she's going to wear. He's going to do a quick fitting to get it all uh, rigged up for her. And so what this is going to do, it's going to press so hard against your lower extremities, there's like air bladders in there. And what it'll do is force that butt back up into your head. Good. And that'll keep it from passing out. It's good so the blood will rush out of my head? The Thunderbirds promote the Air Force. By doing media flights, the team and their upcoming air show receive coverage on local television newscasts. Okay, Mark, you're first going to be letting you sign some papers here just so you don't hold Lance uh, to blame here for anything. And uh, uh, actually, this is an enlistment for me. I want to get you uh, in the Air Force uh, here. We're going to climb to about 17,000 feet, feel your G suit in flight around you, and you'll, you'll feel that feeling that you get when you. Uh, have you ever ridden the, the hammer at the uh, the carnival? I try to stay away from. You try to stay away from those. Well, we, we're not going to be too tough on you, but we'll do this one. In less than 20 minutes, anchorwoman Margarita Zavala is taxiing for takeoff, and the Air Force is on television. Don't ask me why I ever agreed to do this. Call it stupid. Call it brave. Just call it over fast. Okay, release brakes. Power uh, right on up. Okay, now I'm selecting the afterburner. I feel that sort of kick in the pants there. That's the burner kicking in. What a thrill. We climbed 17,000 feet in 20 seconds, pulling in three Gs. I could feel my G-suit inflate, squeezing my lower body so the blood could stay in my brain instead of rushing to my feet. In the middle of the desert, we did maneuvers called lazy eights, whiffer dills, and rolls. Any way you call it, I was upside down most of the time. One of the highlights of this unforgettable ride was when Captain Unjum let me fly the plane. My once-in-a-lifetime thrill was over in less than an hour. And just for the record, yes, I did get sick, but I also had the time of my life. Margarita Savala, New Center 9. It's 6.30 a.m. Saturday morning. Today is the first scheduled air show of the season. At dawn, the Thunderbird crew is already at work, preparing for the afternoon's main event. Tucson is one of the earliest scheduled air shows of the season, and its proximity to Nellis makes it an ideal shakedown cruise. Although Davis Mountain Air Force Base is a modern fighter training center, it's best known as the storage center for obsolete aircraft. These proud planes have outlived their usefulness to America's military. They've been replaced with newer ones that fly higher, faster, and farther. Over 3,000 of these old warbirds sit in the dry Arizona air at Davis Montham. Some will be used for spare parts. Others await their final flight as a pilotless drone, a target for today's advanced weaponry. There's a feeling of excitement in the air as the crowd pours into the base. And it's not just the planes. It's a beautiful day to spend in the sunshine with the entire family. A day to see and touch aircraft that most people only get to read about in books and magazines. A performance by the Thunderbirds always attracts a huge audience, and today is no exception. Over 100,000 people are on hand to see the team's first official air show of the season. Men, women, boys, girls. The crowd's a true cross-section of America. All right, let's get going here. The Thunderbirds are always the grand finale of an air show. While the acts that precede them perform for the crowds, the officers of the team meet for a final pre-flight briefing. With over 100,000 spectators, nothing can be left All right, to chance. Any questions on that? Like a size, size would be All operating. aspects of the upcoming demonstration are reviewed. The logistics officer, or loggy, reports on wind conditions above the field. The pilots review safety procedures. Safe ejection areas are memorized. You can have it aboard on the runway. For the unlikely event of a flameout at low altitudes. Let's make it a good, safe one. Remember, uh, there is no pressure to. Uh, to complete a maneuver that's not set up properly, abort the maneuver. A lot of people will be watching us and are cheering for us. So let's make it a good, safe one and go out and do a good one. All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to 30 minutes. This is third for the city fly. My name is Premier and Harry Lemonstration Team, the United States Air Force Thunderbird. For some 37 years now, this team will be taking the Air Force Dory. 
All eyes are on the Thunderbird pilots as the last three months of practice and all the team effort are about to be tested. The Thunderbirds are a military squadron performing at a military base, but the FAA has jurisdiction because civilians are present. The FAA monitored the show for both the show line and the fact that nobody's out there, and for the air show itself, that nothing gets too loose or uh, too low or anything of that sort. As the team takes off in full afterburner, each of the jets develops over 24,000 pounds of thrust. Translated into horsepower, each F-16 is more powerful than five diesel locomotives. The commander leader lines the Thunderbirds up for the first pass by the crowd, the traditional four-ship diamond. To keep the show at a fast-moving pace, whenever the formation exits show center, the number five and six jets perform their exciting solos. This maneuver looks like fun, but it's actually performed to demonstrate a pilot's ability to control a high-performance aircraft at near-minimum controllable airspeeds. There's never more than a few seconds between maneuvers. During the demonstration, the pilots fly along an imaginary show line. For safety reasons, the show line is at least 1,500 feet away from the crowd line, and those distances are carefully monitored. For obvious reasons, the Thunderbirds don't break the sound barrier during their air show demonstration, but on some of the solo maneuvers, the speed is very close. To the earthbound crowd, many of the routines look like spectacular daredevil stunts. But they're actually part of every Air Force pilot's training. The Thunderbirds just fly them lower and tighter. They call this the crossover break, and to the startled spectators, it looks like the jets were flying side by side. Some of the simplest maneuvers, like this slow roll, are the hardest to perfect. Several times during the performance, all six jets joined together for breathtaking examples of formation flight. The grand finale of the air show is the bomb burst, and it's a Thunderbird trademark. As the four-ship diamond splits apart in a vertical climb, each pilot heads to a different compass point. The solo pilot spirals through the center. From the ground, the smoke trails look like the petals of a giant flower. With careful timing and critical altitude separation, the jets appear to just miss each other at the crossover. Forty minutes after engine start, the first air show of the season is over. Five minutes later, the six F-16s are back on Earth. When the men and women of the Thunderbird team joined the military, they never thought they'd be heroes, but they are. Because they're not just Thunderbirds. They're representatives of the 600,000 men and women who serve their country in the United States Air Force. Hello, how are you today? Great. Great show, appreciate it. Well, we enjoy doing it. There you go. You're welcome. Was I out of position in Not at all. I watched you very carefully. Keep my eye on your How you doing? Your favorite maneuver. It's a favorite thing we did today. It was a quiz. Take one of those.
<laughs> Y'all from Tucson here? Yes. Is that right? All the fires come out of the team at least a thousand hours already. I know, but I'll have all night to work it out. There you go. Okay, we'll do. I'd like to show you. What school do you go to? How does the South Point fight sound go? Would you sing for a bit? <laughs> Not even free friended. Yeah, you get the real workers in here, I'm telling you. <laughs> we don't go anywhere without these. Thank you.